non ci sono ancora. Ma cosa? Ho sentito i ciccaroni. Erano qua davanti. anche dei incenti sì, mi raccomando il decano eh. buonasera al preside alla magnifica direttrice buonasera buonasera Giovanni siamo già connessi sono connesse già moltissime persone in un attimo cominciamo giusto ai sax we are going to start in a few minutes nel frattempo, buonasera alla rettrice e buonasera a Mario Tiberi. Buonasera, Preside. Perfetto, allora direi che possiamo cominciare in modo tale da non diciamo, perdere altro tempo. Eh, vi ringrazio tutti quanti per la partecipazione a Elezioni Caffè, che quest'anno, grazie soprattutto alla capacità di Mario Di Beri, siamo riusciti ad organizzare. Eh, non, non mi dilungo con, con i saluti perché c'è la magnifica rettrice e do la parola alla nostra rettrice per i saluti istituzionali. Buonasera, grazie, grazie per questo invito, care studentesse, cari studenti, colleghe, colleghi, autorità presenti, signore e signori. E sapienza che ho l'onore di rappresentare dal primo di dicembre di quest'anno, si unisce oggi al Dipartimento di Economia e Diritto della Facoltà di Economia per ricordare la figura e l'opera del professore Federico Caffè. E vi porto il saluto di tutta la nostra comunità accademica della Sapienza e lo estendo a tutti gli ospiti che sono presenti. Esprimo tra l'altro il più sincero benvenuto a, al professor eh, Sachs, University Professor a Columbia University, e, e per, eh, per essere eh, con noi. Gli siamo molto grati per aver accettato questo invito a svolgere le lezioni eh, Federico Caffè per l'anno 2020 dal titolo il mondo nel 2050. Lo ringraziamo veramente molto non solo per la sua disponibilità che ha dimostrato in questa, questo momento, ma anche per la sua volontà di eh, voler contribuire a dimostrare che questa pandemia da Covid-19 che ha sconvolto tutto il mondo non sarà mai più in grado di arrestare il progresso scientifico. Questo è un è un passaggio importante, un progresso scientifico, l'insegnamento e il dibattito che si svolge all'interno dell'Accademia. Oltre che eh, una volontà di tipo intellettuale, per noi è un dovere morale ricordare Federico Caffè, che è stato un grande maestro della nostra università. Per mantenere viva quindi la sua memoria e il suo insegnamento tra chi lo ha conosciuto e per dare una, una testimonianza ai nostri studenti di trarne esempio e un alimento per eh, quello che ha fatto nella sua vita e per eh, diciamo, l'espressione del suo pensiero. Si ricorda Federico Caffè ogni anno con le lezioni Federico Caffè che il Dipartimento di Economia e Diritto eh, affida in eh, col concorso della Banca d'Italia a prestigiosi studiosi italiani e stranieri e che diventano patrimonio internazionale con la, con la pubblicazione di un'apposita collana della Cambridge University Press. Eh, Federico Caffè è stato un eh, economista eminente, erudito, un professionista appassionato e veramente esemplare, un assiduo divulgatore del eh, pensiero economico, un protagonista del dibattito di politica economica che si è svolto nel nostro paese dal dopoguerra agli anni Ottanta. 
è stato uno dei primi a far conoscere in Italia la teoria eh, di Keynes e a riconoscere nell'economia del benessere il fondamento dell'intervento pubblico in economia. È stato un osservatore attentissimo dell'attualità economica e ha contribuito al dibattito sull'economia sull e e la società italiana con numerosissimi scritti accademici e strette collaborazioni con giornali e riviste. Caffè ha formato veramente diverse generazioni di economisti, relatore di oltre mille tesi di laurea, e alcuni dei suoi allievi, che sono tra i quali anche alcuni organizzatori dell'evento di oggi, insegnano eh, in questa facoltà e sono dei Diciamo, di, sono, e, e tramandano eh, il, loro, il suo insegnamento altri allievi invece si trovano e si sono trovati al vertice di istituzioni economiche nazionali e internazionali con il governatore della Banca d'Italia Ignazio Visco il, il precedente presidente della Banca Centrale Europea Mario Draghi per tutti coloro che l'hanno conosciuto Caffè non è stato solamente un lucido, convincente e affascinante studioso ma anche un individuo profondamente umano, sincero partecipe dei problemi e delle sofferenze altrui è stata proprio questa ricchezza interiore unita alla sua vasta cultura che ha fatto di lui un vero caposcuola amato dagli studenti, dai suoi allievi che aveva sempre sentito i vicini come un'altra famiglia, al pari di quella personale. La sua figura e la lungimiranza del suo pensiero scientifico restano vive nel ricordo e negli affetti di chi ha avuto il privilegio vero di conoscerlo. Anch'io ho potuto conoscere personalmente la sua gentilezza e la sua umanità. Quando ero una studentessa di medicina di questo Ateneo, studiavo con una collega che abitava a Pia Cadloro, era proprio l'abitazione il professore Federico Caffè e ricordo diciamo, i suoi interventi giardino tra giardino e il suo, eh, così, eh, il suo esserci eh, così, come dire, eh, vicino con dei consigli mentre io e la mia collega eh, studiavamo nel periodo estivo e quindi anche io ho un ricordo personale del professore Federico Caffè. Caffè aveva uno stile di vita veramente sobrio e estremamente riservato. È stato un docente attento, corretto, disponibile, generosissimo verso i suoi studenti e i suoi allievi. È stato un divulgatore veramente infaticabile, sempre ehm, fuori dal coro. È stato anche capace di parlare il linguaggio erudito della teoria e di divulgare il pensiero di altri, di dialogare con gli accademici. E con le più alte autorità dello Stato, con i rappresentanti sindacali, i lettori dei quotidiani. È stato l'interlocutore privilegiato di figure veramente eminenti come Azzolina, Baffi, Carli, Ciampi, Enaudi, Parri, Ruini e per questi soggetti è stato ogni volta in volta apprezzato collega, eh, stimato ispiratore consulente, insegnante e maestro, ma anche rispettato avversario. E con tutti si è sempre confrontato a seconda delle, della necessità del tema del momento su delle questioni eh, astratte o argomenti di attualità politico-sociale, dei temi che si ponevano sia a livello nazionale che internazionale, dettagli magari legati a curiosità intellettuali, problemi concreti di tutti i giorni. Lo ha fatto senza indulgere mai in nessun narcisismo intellettuale, nel conformismo, nella ricerca del consenso. E insegnava come l'efficienza non fosse in contrasto con l'equità ma anzi come tra di esse esistesse veramente un nesso positivo riteneva che il pieno impiego fosse l'obiettivo primario da conseguire anche attribuendo al potere pubblico la funzione di occupatore di ultima istanza credeva nell'egualitarismo e nello Stato garante del benessere sociale, affidava all'intervento pubblico una funzione fondamentale per il corretto funzionamento dell'economia e pensava che l'enfasi dovesse essere posta più sui vuoti da colmare che sugli eccessi da eliminare nell'operato del welfare state. Questa lezione è stata l'insegnamento per i suoi allievi ed è oggi il patrimonio di tutta la sapienza. E quindi il pensiero di Federico Caffè è ancora estremamente attuale, anche perché ci ha insegnato che le diverse velocità 
di percorso dei territori e delle economie che vanno a comporre il pianeta possono provocare tensioni sociali oltre che economiche, quello che se possiamo registrare. Ci ha insegnato che è un vero dovere per noi impegnarci per eliminare queste tensioni garantendo il diritto alla salute, all'istruzione, oltre che una crescita equilibrata e sostenibile, l'occupazione e l'equità distributiva. E certo in questo momento la considerazione che come questa pandemia abbia accentuato tutte le disuguaglianze e sotto gli occhi di tutti perché la e concludo l'economia mondiale non sarà mai veramente unita se non si sarà se si avrà porsi al servizio dell'uomo se non saprà appunto includere anziché dividere se non saprà favorire il lavoro l'uguaglianza il rispetto reciproco e la dignità umana e questo è l'unico futuro possibile. Federico Caffè ha dedicato tutta la sua vita all'insegnamento di questi ideali. È una visione che in questo momento ci unisce non solo nel ricordo ma anche nella volontà di andare a conseguire questo futuro possibile. E per questi motivi oggi vogliamo ricordare Federico Caffè con le lezioni che sono state a lui dedicate e che verranno svolte da uno dei più importanti economisti esistenti a livello internazionale, il professor Sachs. Vi ringrazio molto per l'attenzione e vi auguro un buon lavoro. Grazie, grazie mille alla nostra magnifica lettrice. Adesso passo la parola al nostro preside Fabrizio D'Ascianzio. Buonasera magnifica lettrice, buonasera colleghi e buonasera anche al professore Jeffrey Sachs. Eh, Intanto vi ringrazio per l'invito, è, è un piacere essere presente ogni volta al momento in cui si svolgono le lezioni caffè perché rappresentano un importantissimo momento in cui veramente i protagonisti del mondo economico vengono invitati, in questo caso purtroppo solo virtualmente nella nostra facoltà, per portare la loro conoscenza. Come ben sapete la nostra facoltà è particolarmente legata alla, al ricordo e alla figura del professore Caffè che ha insegnato qui per tanti anni e che purtroppo nell'87 è misteriosamente scomparso e nessuno è ancora riuscito a capire bene che cosa sia davvero successo. Io nel 1987 ero un, un giovane studente, a freshman come si dice in inglese, e eh, frequentavo il secondo anno delle lezioni, ma non ho avuto la possibilità di poter incontrare il professore Caffè, perché nel, nel mio eh, insegnamento il professore era un altro. E ho assistito nel corso del tempo e ho partecipato alle varie manifestazioni di commemorazione del professore Caffè e proprio per questo particolare attaccamento da parte della facoltà nei confronti della figura di un veramente di un maestro eh, nel più vero termine della parola e la nostra facoltà con poi l'approvazione del senato accademico ha deliberato di intitolare un'aula alla figura al ricordo del professore caffè in particolare l'aula numero 5 che era proprio l'aula in cui il professore caffè faceva lezione Purtroppo l'epidemia del Covid-19 non ci ha consentito di fare una, una cerimonia di intitolazione di quest'aula, l'abbiamo tenuta in sospeso. Come il professore Di Bartolomeo e il professore Tiberi sanno, la nostra intenzione sarebbe stata proprio di fare la cerimonia di intitolazione dell'aula dell 5 al professore Caffè durante le lezioni Caffè, ma purtroppo questo non è stato possibile. Eh, lo rimandiamo ad un momento sicuramente più, più felice, più tranquillo, speriamo nel, nel 2021 di poter portare a termine questa nostra operazione che ha richiesto un po' di tempo però è stata molto eh, apprezzata da tutti i colleghi e cercheremo di fare in modo che possa eh, svilupparsi nel migliore dei modi appena sarà possibile con una cerimonia che però vogliamo fare in presenza. Io apprezzo moltissimo questa modalità di piattaforma telematica, però ci sono alcune cose che vanno fatte in presenza, che vanno fatte con la partecipazione dei colleghi. E quindi non appena sarà possibile, con l'aiuto della Magnifica Rettrice, sicuramente saremo in grado di poter sviluppare questa cerimonia. 
non voglio trattenervi troppo anche perché purtroppo io nel frattempo stavo facendo lezione, ho interrotto la lezione perché ci tenevo ad essere presente, però poi dopo mi dovrò eh, ricollegare con la lezione il bello ma anche il brutto delle piattaforme che si può passare da una cosa all'altra in, un, in pochissimo tempo. Però ecco, ci tenevo davvero ad essere presente sia per, per rendere omaggio al, al professore Sachs che è una figura di primissimo piano di, della Columbia University e dove io ho avuto anche il piacere di, di poter andare, dove ho avuto la, la possibilità di conoscere anche una collega italiana che lavora all'Italian Academy di, di, di Colombia che si chiama Barbara Faedda e che è una mia buona amica e che penso che anche il professore Sachs conosca. E ciò detto, io non voglio intrattenervi oltre, voglio ringraziare nuovamente gli organizzatori. Consentitemi di fare un ringraziamento speciale al professore Tiberi, che eh, ci mette sempre veramente tutto se stesso per l'organizzazione delle lezioni caffè. Eh, tutti gli altri colleghi lo supportano nel migliore dei modi come solo loro sanno fare, però consentitemi questo piccolo pensiero particolare nei confronti del professore Tiberi che nonostante diciamo, i tanti anni di insegnamento continua a mettere tutta la passione in questa iniziativa e quindi mi sembrava giusto dare il riconoscimento. Grazie, concludo, grazie ancora, grazie Giovanni e grazie davvero al professore Sachs che è stato qui con noi. Perfetto, grazie mille al nostro preside, alla nostra magnifica lettrice e... Diciamo, io sarò molto molto breve, anche perché il professor Sachs non ha bisogno di introduzione, perché è un professore a Columbia University, è stato professore ad Harvard, è uno degli economisti più influenti al mondo, perché combina molto bene la parte diciamo, della, dello studio dell'economia con l'applicazione dell'economia, è consulente delle Nazioni Unite, ha avuto, ha avuto numerosi ruoli, e personalmente sono molto molto onorato che lui sia qui a tenere le lezioni oggi. Sono dispiaciuto del fatto che le lezioni si tengono in questa modalità un po' più fredda e meno diciamo, tradizionale. Tuttavia lo ringrazio moltissimo di aver comunque diciamo, eh, accettato di, di tenere lezioni e di darci comunque la possibilità di mantenere una continuità in questa nostra tradizione. Sarò anche molto felice se magari nel prossimo futuro lo potremo avere qui di, di persona, eh, qui a Roma di persona. Eh, detto questo, come vi, come vi ripeto, il professor Sachs non ha bisogno di introduzioni, è uno degli economisti più famosi al mondo, è uno dei, dei più influenti. Io ricordo, studiai quando ero ragazzo, insomma, le sue teorie, studiai le sue teorie e continuo a, a leggere le sue teorie adesso che ormai sono non vecchio ma ormai grande. Eh, io mi sono laureato a 27 anni e il professor Sachs a 28 anni era già professore ad Harvard, quindi penso che questo possa bastare come introduzione, non vi, non vi annoio e lascerei la parola al professor Sachs perché sono molto impaziente di sentire che cosa ci racconterà lui circa il nostro futuro. Quindi cedo la parola al professor Sachs che ringrazio molto sentitamente a nome di tutto il Dipartimento e di tutti. Grazie. Thank you so much. Thank you for the generosity to uh asked me to give this important lecture uh, as part of this important lecture series. I'm incredibly honored. And uh, those of you who know me know that I would never, ever miss an opportunity to be in Rome. Uh, so if we could be there physically, uh, my wife who's in the next room would testify that it's my favorite place on the whole planet. Uh, I've seen a lot of places, but Rome really is the eternal city and the center of, uh, from my point of view, uh, the center of good life. And so I hope you'll keep the door open for me to come next year when we're vaccinated and this uh, pandemic is under control, uh, because I would love to be with you in person. And I also want to uh, say how honored I am to be part of this series. Uh, Professor Caffè was a, a remarkable person. Uh, I didn't know him uh, as, as a person uh, only of him, uh, but clearly he was a remarkable personality as well as a remarkable economist uh, because uh, such fondness uh, is expressed in writing by many students uh, as well as by you today. And the fact of this lecture series shows that somebody uh, has had a personal 
impact uh, that's very powerful on an institution. And uh, I think I can understand that because his concerns and his uh, way of thinking about economics is so congenial for me. He took economic policy as the central issue of economics. That is economics as an improving science, uh, as a inherently a normative enterprise. Uh, whereas in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, uh, normativity is looked at with great suspicion. Uh, don't tell us your values, those are arbitrary. Just tell us the facts, so-called. And the Anglo-Saxon tradition of economics, which came to dominate uh, economics uh, in especially the 20th century and especially the post-war period, uh, lacks the humanity and the ethics and the historical perspective uh, that uh, Professor Cafe brought to the field. And I note that uh, in uh, tributes to him, it's been emphasized that he combined economics, history, and ethics. And that is an absolutely necessary and wonderful combination. Uh, I can understand as I get older why that could not happen from the US base, by the way, because we lost contact with so much that is valuable about uh, the ethical tradition of the West uh, in very peculiar and particular ways. But uh, Professor Cafe obviously embodied that great tradition of ethics and you can't give it up. And the idea of economics as a field that merely predicts uh, or merely explains, but doesn't try to improve makes no sense in my view. Uh, it would be like having a medical school that uh, observed disease and tried to explain it, but didn't try to fix it uh, or said, well, making someone healthy, that's a value judgment. Uh, we just uh, study pathology and we're good at it and we can predict when you're gonna die. That would be a very strange field, uh, actually. Uh, medicine inherently is an ethical field uh, because it is a field with a telos, with a purpose, uh, and the purpose is health. And economics should be a field with a purpose, and the purpose should be human well being, or what the Greeks called eudaimonia. And I think that this is what uh, Professor Cafe uh, exemplified and uh, what makes me so proud to be part of this lecture series. Now, I think that there is a deep crisis in economics uh, today, the way it is practiced and the, even the questions that are asked and also the ways that those questions are answered. Because if economics is viewed as explaining business cycles or observing economic aggregates, it's not entirely surprising that it misses the biggest challenges facing humanity. Economics has not been in the forefront of solving the crisis of climate change or environmental destruction or mass and growing inequality or public health and facing calamities like COVID-19. Of course, there are economists that work on these issues, but these have not been the central concerns of economics. And I believe that that already gives away a part of the story because these are the most powerful forces affecting human well-being, even human survival. And how could they not be at the center of our concern? Well, I think if the field limits itself to trying to understand market dynamics, and if it views government intervention as an exception, and it views government intervention with skepticism inherently, and with a bias that the 
uh, the, the, the anonymous uh, working of market forces will somehow uh, achieve uh, desired outcomes, we are bound to fail. And even when our field allows for the imperfections here and there and uh, the uh, interventions uh, for stabilization or to correct market failures, it is more the afterthought rather than the idea of molding our material lives to achieve human goals. We're too shy about that, in my opinion. And therefore, we're not asking the constructive questions about how to design uh, the pathways that we need for broad, shared, global well-being and safety. And by asking those questions, where are we going? And how can we get to where we want to go? And how can we steer in the direction that we want to head? I think we make a better economics, but that is inherently an ethical economics because ethics is about choosing the good. And that means having an idea about what is good and then about the technical questions of how to achieve the good. So inherently ethics and uh, understanding uh, how uh, resources are used and distributed go hand in hand. Well, I want to talk about one way of thinking about that question today and tomorrow. And that is uh, to start with the basic idea that we are really at a crossroads. Uh, that is a, a cliche to say we're at a crossroads and we have to decide which way to go. But I'm going to argue this is not a cliche, that humanity at the global scale faces a fundamental choice in this moment, not only in the pandemic, which is so harrowing, but in the direction of our overall environmental safety and our social harmony in the future. And the reason we face these choices is that the market economic system that we have operating globally, the kind of global capitalist system that we have, does not solve crucial problems. Indeed, it deepens them. And so we have to make choices if we are going to arrive in the next generation with the kind of future that we would like. In other words, if we are to have the good, and especially for our children to have the good earth and the good life, we have to make conscious choices now and choices that are collective choices, not choices as individual consumers and workers and members of a household, but collective choices as citizens, and not only as citizens of our countries, but as citizens of a world that is deeply interconnected. So my argument today is that we are really at a crossroads, and my argument tomorrow is that we can direct the allocation of resources over the coming 30 years to build the kind of future that we should want should in the sense that it is the one indicated by good ethics, the one that will lead to eudaimonia, to well-being of the human population. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to uh, make the argument today about why we are at a crossroads. And the title of these lectures is The World in 2050 because I believe that we need to choose today the investments and the strategies that are going to determine the world in 2050. Because most of the investments we need to make, whether it's investments in our children's education or whether it's investments in our energy systems, 
uh, our, and our physical infrastructure are long lasting investments and determine the course of our local, national and global economy over a period of roughly 30 years. I don't speak about the world in 2100 because it's something to think about, but too hard to direct. Uh, whereas the world in 2050 is actually a practical time horizon. It's much longer than our governments think about when we have a President Trump, the uh, time duration of thinking is to the next tweet. Uh, it isn't even a 24 hour news cycle. Uh, more normally when we have uh, uh, mentally stable presidents, maybe they think in terms of the next election, but we need to think in a 30 year time horizon because that is the real nature of the investment horizon that we face, whether it's for investments in people, especially our children, or investments in infrastructure, or investments in the maturation of new technologies, which have their own gestation periods and which also have time horizons of a generation. So I believe that there are two futures possible that we should pay attention to. A true, accurate, possible dystopia. In other words, a world falling apart. I don't think that that is an illusion. I think it is a real possibility. But there's also the possibility of sustainable development. Sustainable development means prosperity, social justice, and environmental sustainability. It sounds utopian, but I don't wanna use the word utopian because I don't mean a place that doesn't exist. I wanna talk about the sustainable development possibility because I think it is as realistic and obviously desirable compared with uh, the dystopian view. If you ask me, well, which of these is what's going to happen? The point of my lectures is of course that that depends on human volition and that depends on collective choice. Collective choice at the global level, but also as manifested by collective decision-making at different levels of collection and collectivity, whether it's the UN system or whether it is our regional organizations like the uh, European Union, or whether it is our nation states, or whether it is the city of Rome, uh, we have collective choices to make to achieve sustainable development and to avoid the dystopian threat. What is the dystopian threat? The dystopian threat, in my opinion, has at least four elements to it. First is that some parts of the world would not escape from extreme deprivation. And one possible dystopia is that Africa, which I will show you in just a moment, will have a significant population in the future, could be overwhelmed and not break out of extreme deprivation, indeed fall into a downward spiral rather than an escape from poverty. So that's one kind of this part of dystopia. A second is soaring inequality, even in our own countries, in Italy or in the United States. This pandemic has been a pandemic of inequality. This has been a pretty good year economically for professionals. They have savings in stock market that has gone up. Uh, most of us work online uh, rather routinely. We've been able to remain mostly safe, uh, of course, with the tragic uh, ex counter examples, but compared to poor workers who are working in the shops, uh, in uh, the streets, uh, in uh, the informal economy, 
uh, that don't have savings invested in the stock market, that don't teach their courses online. It's a completely different world. And in general, this inequality has been widening for decades, mainly widening according to educational attainment. In the United States, but I think it's true in Italy and in Europe more generally, those with a university degree, by and large, are doing well, with exceptions. But those with less than a university degree, by and large, are struggling. Struggling with housing, struggling uh, with the uh, uh, subsistence in some cases, struggling with the uh, health conditions uh, that are worse, and so on. Now, a third part of the dystopian threat is environmental calamity. And we have at least four dimensions of environmental collapse underway. The first, of course, is runaway human-induced climate change. Human activity has already warmed the planet by 1.2 degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial average temperature. The temperature is rising by around 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. We have reason to believe that even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, we may reach a tipping point or a threshold that will propel us into a even more dangerous accelerated warming because of release of uh, greenhouse gas from the permafrost, a change of ocean circulation. We may uh, experience a catastrophic collapse of the Antarctic West uh, ice sheet and so forth, leading to several meters sea level rise. We're on the brink of climate disaster. This is no secret. Uh, we have known about it for a long time. We have not acted upon it. The second is a collapse of biodiversity. Species abundance, whole classes of species are collapsing because human beings have appropriated half or more of the non-desert, non-ice land area for human food production, pasture land and cropland, or for managed forests. We're destroying habitats of other species. Uh, livestock and human biomass is about 95% of all mammal biomass on the planet now. In other words, our livestock have pushed out uh, other land mammals uh, out of their habitat. We make room for our cattle and we destroy the rest of nature. The third dimension of environmental collapse, of course, is mega pollution. We know that the plastics and the microplastics are in every part of the food chain, terrestrial and ocean. We know that air pollution is a mass killer of millions we suspect that the heavy burden of COVID-19 in Northern Italy related also to the heavy air pollution in the North, because uh, we need an explanation why there have been such geographically different outcomes in Italy from COVID-19. But one theory is that the air pollution has been a, an aggravating factor. And of course, the fourth dimension of environmental collapse is the increasing frequency of zoonotic diseases. COVID-19 is only the latest. We have had SARS in 2003, H1N1 recombinant influenza, Nipah virus, Middle East respiratory syndrome, Ebola outbreaks, all of them reflecting the transfer of pathogens from animal reservoirs to humans when humanity disturbed the natural environment. For example, disturbed the fruit bat population or the horseshoe bat population, came into contact with bats that are carrying Ebola or uh, SARS or SARS-CoV-2. And so these increasingly frequent zoonotic events are also a reflection of this real dystopian threat. And then I would add finally, 
geopolitics on the brink. In a way, it is our existential reality since 1945, really since 1949, since the Soviet Union also uh, exploded an atomic bomb, that we have been on the brink, minutes to midnight, as the atomic scientists say. But we also, despite the nuclear threat, we continue to engage in big power rivalries of exactly the kind that gave rise to World War I, for example. But the difference is that this time it's with nuclear weapons. We almost destroyed the world in October 1962. And now the uh, absolutely reckless and foolish uh, Trump administration has tried to build up a Cold War against China. My country's politicians have been idiots. Uh, they are completely uh, without uh, historical awareness or sense of responsibility, precaution, or what the Greeks called phronesis, practical wisdom. So they are crusaders or evangelical uh, preachers of a US-led world, which is extraordinarily dangerous. These facts, extreme poverty, rising inequality, environmental collapse, geopolitical tensions, are the direction that we're on. This dystopian threat, some people would say, well, Professor Sachs, so what else is new? How could it be any other way? This is rather shocking because we are a rich world with uh, an inheritance of the most uh, beneficent potentially and powerful technologies to overcome extreme deprivation or to solve environmental crises. And yet we don't do so. And what I would say about economics, however, is that not that it has neglected these topics, but these have hardly been the center of economics attention. Somehow mainstream economics, in my country at least, has been about whether the US economy will grow by 2% or 2.4%, how to handle uh, the business cycle uh, and uh, so forth. Not about these great existential questions of the direction of the world as if these are somehow somebody else's concern. I'm not sure whose concern they should be, if not ours as economists who are charged with understanding the dynamics of the material world and how the material world uh, is affected by human activity and the kinds of choices that we should be making about human activity. Now, all of these points that I've made are before our eyes every day. The mass displacement of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, in the United States, uh, the stunning fact that uh, a recent Nobel laureate, Angus Deaton, has rightly and wonderfully emphasized that our inequality, for example, is so great and rising in the United States that we have two trajectories of deaths or of mortality. For college-educated people, men and women, the mortality trajectory are the gray flat lines at the bottom. In other words, the age-adjusted mortality rate is basically unchanging over the last 20 years. Whereas the upward sloping red lines for high school or less educational attainment signify rising death rates, age specific rising death rates for high school educated men and women. It's two different societies, those with the bachelor's degree and those with the high school degree or less. Those with the bachelor degree or more see rising incomes, work from home, are working online, 
are largely escaping the pandemic except for the health workforce. Those with a high school degree or less are working in factories or in shops or in transport or in delivery, and they are becoming infected. Uh, but be even before that, there were rising suicide rates, rising uh, alcoholism, rising drug dependence. Two societies, two different outcomes within the same country. And of course, two different politics as a result of this. We know that global warming, as I said, is out of control. Uh, this graph, uh, which I won't elaborate at length, explains that we should be on the lower trajectory of the gray curve at the bottom in order to keep emissions falling in order to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius upper limit of warming. But instead, we are on the continuing upward sloping curves of rising emissions. This is up to COVID-19, but it will remain true in the post-COVID period unless we choose to turn the emissions curve downward. So this graph to be elaborated is from UNEP, the UN Environment Program, explaining that while we need to be suppressing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions in fact continue to rise. We also have a collapse of species abundance. Uh, this is a well-known curve produced by the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, called the Global Living Planet Index. It is a measure of species abundance across more than 4,000 species. And the minus 68% shown from 1970 to 2018 signifies a 68% decline on average of species across a very wide range of species. We're basically destroying the habitats of other species. And this abundance is falling for several reasons. One, in the fisheries, we're overfishing uh, the fisheries. On land, we're either claiming the habitat of other species by deforesting and extending pasture lands and croplands, or we're destroying the habitability of land by human-induced climate change, or we are destroying the uh, viability of other species through human-made pollution, or the introduction of invasive species, that is non-native species that take over like weeds, a new ecological setting. But the gist of it is a massive collapse of species abundance. This fact is hardly known in the public discourse, and it is hardly known in economics, actually. It's an esoteric topic, not a central concern, as we drive the other 10 million species to the brink of survival. This complicated picture is from an important paper about the world's food system. It shows the very heavy burden that our current agricultural system imposes on the environment on multiple dimensions, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water use, nitrogen flux, and phosphorus flux. In other words, the flow of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment, in the water and in the air, uh, and uh, in the soils. And what it is showing, again, it needs to be written down and studied rather than uh, talked about in uh, one minute. It shows that the way we produce food for the 7.8 billion people on the planet is having a massive detrimental effect on the environment. But even worse, we're on a trajectory to 2050 where it could all get dramatically worse. Roughly somewhere between 25% and 30% 
of all greenhouse gas emissions today come from agriculture and land use transformation. Roughly a third of the greenhouse emissions. But all of those problems are getting worse. There's not one with a positive trajectory right now. So this says we can't even feed ourselves properly in a sustainable manner. And of course, we have COVID-19, if I needed to add to the litany of woes that our world faces. Finally, let me say there is lurking behind this a question that can be called the Malthusian specter, because uh, the most pessimistic economist in the classic age was Thomas Robert Malthus, the uh, parson uh, in uh, England in the late uh, 18th century, who wrote in 1798, The Principles of Population, where he claimed we can never rise above subsistence because if we do, the population will increase sufficiently to drive us back to subsistence. And of course, since he wrote that, classical economists and neoclassical economists, especially neoclassical economists since the second half of the 19th century, have been making fun of Malthus, saying, wrong, too pessimistic. <laughs> After all, we've gotten rich. We avoided the Malthusian specter. But I would say not so fast, because when Malthus wrote in 1798, the population on the planet was 900 million people. Today, it is 7.8 billion people, roughly nine times as high. Soon, it will be 10 times as high as when Malthus wrote. We have not proven that 10 billion people can live sustainably on the planet. We have proved that we can raise living standards temporarily, but if those dystopian trends that I just indicated are continuing, the viability of the planet for all but the elite is absolutely called into question. And so, as you can see in this projection using the UN's medium fertility variant, we are in 2020 at 7.8 billion, but the UN in its medium fertility assessment projects a population of 11.2 billion people, another 3.4 billion people added to the planet during the 21st century. Can we manage all of those environmental and social threats with the population still rising by another 3.4 billion people. So these big challenges, of course, uh, are part of our human discourse, though not sufficiently part of our economics agenda, though they're becoming more central. But there are at least three temptations that have arisen that I would say are all dangerous. One is an apocalyptic tradition uh, which is uh, unfortunately with a significant base in uh, the United States, a belief that we are at the end times. And uh, it, it, we have 20% uh, of our population who are fundamentalist Christians who uh, hear from their uh, ministers sermons about the end times as being exemplified by all of these crises, that this is the prophecy of the book of Revelations, uh, that we are about to face Armageddon. Some even look forward to this. It's terrifying. I would not recommend having a secretary of state or a foreign minister who believes in Armageddon. Uh, believe me, it's not a good thing. A second temptation is uh, an anti-technology response secular that says, well, look what technology has gotten us into. We have to go back to simplicity. Technology is wrecking us. We have to go back to a simple life so that we don't destroy the earth. The problem with that is that there is no chance in the world 
of feeding and clothing and housing and meeting the basic needs, much less the aspirations of 7.8 billion people in a simple world. Maybe of 50 million people, maybe of 100 million people, but not 7.8 billion people or 9 billion people at mid-century. That kind of world's a complicated world. Every day, 7.8 billion people expect a decent, nutritious food supply, safe drinking water, sanitation, income sufficient to support themselves and their families, shelter, clothing, physical safety. And that is a complicated world, not a simple world. The third anti-technology temptation is the degrowth movement. Well, this is understandable in a way. If growth is destroying the planet, we should degrowth. But I find it much too vague and therefore unhelpful. If it means a sharp cut in living standards, even a sharp cut of living standards just of those in high income countries today, I think it's a misunderstanding. If it means stopping the blind use of the gross domestic product as our benchmark, it's completely correct. But if we're talking about real progress, I'm going to argue we can continue to have real progress in our material lives, in our conditions of living, in our health and longevity, in our ability to achieve well-being. And we should pursue that, but it requires not degrowth in a simple sense of a sharp cut in living standards, but a change in direction of how we produce and how we live. That is the main point that I wanna make. So I believe that in addition to this dystopian threat, there is a sustainable development possibility which is equally realistic and equally compatible with the finite planet, with the functioning of ecosystems, with the survival of biodiversity, and that is a far more desirable direction from the point of view of human well being. In other words, it's the ethical choice. What is the sustainable development possibility? First, it is that poverty would be ended. By poverty, I mean deprivation of basic economic needs. By basic economic needs, I mean those that are enumerated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or in the economic, social, and cultural covenants of the 1960s. So those are adequate food, right to shelter, right to health care, right to education, uh, right to social protection for everybody. And that is what I mean by ending poverty, that all of those basic needs, adequate basic income, health, education, nutrition, health care, shelter, safety, can be achieved for everybody on the planet. Second, and relatedly, inequality can be reduced in that if everybody achieves these basic economic rights, health, education, social protection, nutrition, leisure time, environmental security, that would mark a tremendous reduction of inequality as well. It would, I believe, protect economic human dignity for everybody. Third is environmentally sustainable economic activity. That means that warming, which is on a path to reach three degrees Celsius, would peak before the end of the century at below 1.5 degrees Celsius. It means that we would protect and restore species abundance. It means a circular economy that slashes dramatically 
plastics pollution, toxic air pollution, and so on. For example, by shifting from fossil fuels, which are so polluting, to wind and solar power, which can be produced with very low levels of pollution. And fourth would be precaution against the kind of zoonotic outbreaks that we've devastatingly experienced this year. The fourth dimension of sustainable development would be global peace. It would be a multilateral world system operating under the UN Charter. It would take seriously the preeminent objective of nuclear disarmament, because as long as there are nuclear weapons, much less thousands of nuclear weapons, we are at the knife edge. We are under the sword of Damocles because we have human beings and sometimes in my country, idiots in charge and they should not be in charge, but we have not figured out politically how to keep the demagogues and the mentally unstable and the psychopaths out of power. So they should not have any access whatsoever to nuclear weapons. And we should have systems for maintaining peace. Now, I want to argue this is not utopia, although it sounds a bit utopian. All of this is actually within practical reach in the sense that the resource requirements, what we talk about as economists, the flow of finance, the physical resource availability, the time and attention required to meet these goals is well within our social uh, possibilities. This would not require five planets or uh, overcoming uh, the second law of thermodynamics uh, or any such thing. These are goals that can be achieved practically on our finite physical earth and for a population of eight or nine billion people. I'm going to suggest in a moment, if we're smart, we won't reach 11 billion people uh, because we will help to bring about as part of sustainable development, a voluntary rapid reduction of fertility rates that will mean a lower population in the future. So I'm going to argue today and tomorrow that that sustainable development possibility is practical and that we need a different kind of economics and policymaking. Uh, what uh, Professor Cafe talks about as economic policy as an autonomous discipline, we need a kind of economic policy to direct us to the sustainable development goal rather than to the dystopian path that we are on right now. One part of that is a midway station of the sustainable development goals, which are aimed for the year 2030. We're way behind but it's a good list of 17 goals that address our attention to crucial areas like universal access to education, to healthcare, gender equality, uh, climate action, circular economy, and so forth. So what is the core strategy for achieving sustainable development? From a material point of view or an investment point of view, I point to six main kinds of investments that need to be made. One is educating all children. We've done that in the high income countries to an extent, uh, although this year has been a crisis, but this is not the case for much of the world where hundreds of millions of kids, even before COVID, were not getting an education. That is a shame on humanity, because often these are children in conflict zones or in impoverished countries that cannot afford to put the kids into classrooms, but we haven't seen fit to use our resources to help meet the needs of those children who are otherwise not getting an education. A second investment is in health services for all. And health means two things. One, 
health care in the form of medicine, so hospitals and clinics and doctors, and it also means public health in the sense of what we need more than ever with COVID-19, and that is surveillance system, testing and tracing, and other public health measures for population health. The third transformation we need is the mass deployment of renewable energy and circular economy, meaning different management of waste processes in industry, different materials use, uh, different ways of recycling materials. So both the transformation to renewable energy and to the circular economy are practical technology investments. It means investing in solar and wind fields rather than in coal-fired power plants. It means driving electric vehicles that are powered by wind and solar rather than internal combustion engine vehicles. The fourth investment is a shift to healthier diets, basically less beef, more fish, vegetables, legumes, fruits, nuts, and to sustainable farming practices, agroecological practices. The fifth transformation is to digital, electric, and service-based cities. So what I mean by this is what is sometimes called smart cities, but cities that function in a much cleaner way, all vehicles electric, all buildings heated by electricity rather than by burning coal or wood or heating oil, using digital technologies for e-governance, uh, using e-commerce to a much greater extent because it is an efficient way to transfer resources from a factory to a flat uh, often than it is through traditional retailing. So restructuring our cities for a digital electric service-based age is part of the investments that we need. And the sixth area of investment is digital inclusion because in my view, the digital world, meaning all of the technologies for computation, for data transfer, for artificial intelligence systems, robotics, and so forth, offer an opportunity for tremendous savings on resource use and tremendous improvement in quality of services, e-health, telemedicine, e-governance, and so forth. But again, not something that the market will sort out by itself. The market will lead to monopolies like uh, Amazon or Google, uh, it will not lead to digital inclusion for all. And so all of this is to say that six major kinds of investments, in my opinion, are the big difference of the dystopian future and the sustainable development future. All of this to achieve these investments, however, requires two more things. One is a change of governance structures. So how we actually design public policies and implement them, because this is a 30 year time horizon for short term governance. And second, how we mobilize finance. Because if the finance is limited to market based finance, it will not suffice as we know. So I call these the six transformations to achieve sustainable development. And I, this uh, graph just uh, reiterates those six points, education, health, clean energy and industry, sustainable land use, smart cities, and digital technologies. And this uh, graph I will elaborate in writing details some of the subcomponents of those investments. Now, we're not so far from this vision. And indeed, Europe took a major step forward this year with what I regard as a substantively 
very rich and a very well done approach of the European Commission, then adopted by the European Council, the European Green Deal. It is a rational approach to sustainable development. Indeed, the motto is transforming the EU's economy for a sustainable future. And it's really a good start because it has most or all of the components that I just mentioned. It has uh, preserving biodiversity, sustainable land use, circular economy, clean and affordable energy. In other words, it has the main pillars needed. And it's got in blue at the bottom, you can see in this uh, image by the European Commission, financing the transition and leaving no one behind. In other words, uh, it recognizes that this is a, an investment problem. So it's a, it's a financing challenge. And it is an ethical challenge in that we're aiming for a, an inclusive uh, approach to these issues. It gives me even more confidence that the European Green Deal is spurring similar initiatives in other parts of the world. Korea recently adopted a Korean New Deal that is based on three pillars, a digital New Deal, and of course, Korea is very good at the digital economy, one of the world leaders, a Green New Deal based on low carbon energy, and a stronger safety net for social inclusion. And I'm impressed with what Korea is undertaking to institutionalize this process and to get it funded. Indeed, more and more countries are signing up to a mid-century goal of decarbonization. This includes the European 27, it includes Britain, it includes Ireland, uh, it includes Canada, Chile, South Africa, New Zealand, and it will include the United States wonderfully on January 20th, 2021, when we get rid of our anti-scientific president now and welcome a new, sensible, rational president, uh, Joe Biden who will declare on January 20th that one of the goals of the United States is to decarbonize the US economy by mid-century. So this idea of looking to mid-century, putting a marker on the horizon and then aiming for long-term uh, transformation is actually becoming part of our broad policy, not our national government politics yet, but our broad conceptualization of politics. This is an advance of policymaking. We have the chance to do the same thing with land use. There will be an important conference next May on biological diversity hosted in Kunming, China. And we need similar pathways to 2050, or I should say similar goals for mid-century that we can then design pathways and policies to achieve. There will also be a food systems summit at the United Nations in September, 2021, to ensure safe and nutritious food for all, sustainable consumption, <coughs> nature positive production practices, equitable rural livelihoods, and resiliency, in other words, five goals for sustainable agriculture that are also part of building this long-term sustainable development future. Now, one reason we can do this is that I think we can also realistically put to rest the Malthusian specter. Remember what Malthus said. He said that whenever humanity became a bit richer, more children survive, people, therefore, uh, families have more surviving children, the population increases, and the population rises to a point where the carrying capacity of the planet on a falls 
pushes down living standards once again to subsistence. So Malthus said, you can't get out of poverty because population will always increase after innovations up to the point of depressing living standards once again to subsistence. And this, as I indicated, is still to be proved wrong. But that's our job, is to prove it wrong. Uh, the main reason that it can be proved wrong is something that Malthus didn't really suspect and didn't know about. Uh, and that is that when households reached a certain level of higher income, they chose voluntarily to have fewer children. Malthus assumed the richer, the more children surviving, the faster the population. But in fact, we now understand two centuries later, there is a demographic transition, which is a voluntary reduction of fertility. As households decide, given the value of their time, to have fewer children and to invest more in the upbringing of the children, a kind of responsible parenthood that means that the children are equipped with the health, the nutrition, and the skills that they will need for an advanced economy. And this demographic transition is extremely important for our story. The good news is the following. What you see here is the United Nations current estimate for 2020 and the forecast for the 21st century of the fertility rates by region. And what you can see is that for all regions of the world, but one, fertility rates are about two children per woman. That is what's called the replacement rate. If each woman has two children on average and one is a daughter, each woman is replacing herself with another mother in the following generation. And so if the fertility rate is two, we know we get to a stable population. In fact, the fertility rate hovers around two for most of the world. It's slightly above two now in uh, some regions, uh, slightly above two in Asia, slightly below two in Latin America, much more below two in Europe and North America. But there's one region where the fertility rate remains very, very high, and that is Africa where still the fertility is more than four children per woman on average, meaning that each mother on average has two daughters. And that means the population tendency to double, not to stabilize. And that's what's happening in Africa right now. Why is there one region in the world with high fertility? It is a kind of poverty trap because what has happened is with such uh, poverty in Africa, girls are not able to stay in school and they are dropping out of school or forced out of school after six years or eight years, marrying young without skills in the workforce other than the backbreaking toil uh, in agriculture or in trade because women work so hard in Africa, but without uh, a university education or even a completed high school degree. And those women are having many children, marrying young and having many children. And there's a kind of trap of poverty because the countries do not have the national budgets to ensure universal access to education. And so education levels remain very low. Early marriage remains very high. Fertility remains very high. The population growth is very rapid and the poverty is accentuated. And the, what one can see, uh, this is a complicated map, but it is a map of what's called gender inequality. And it is in tropical Africa where the gender inequality is highest, signifying basically that the girls are not getting adequate schooling. That's what the red uh, for tropical Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East are showing. That's where the fertility rates remain very high. 
So to overcome those high fertility rates, the key is rather simple, which is enable girls to remain in school, stay educated, gain the skills, join the labor market, marry later, engage in responsible parenthood. And that will lead to a voluntary reduction of fertility rates that is quite rapid and therefore changes the dynamics of the population. Now, under the UN's medium fertility forecast, fertility rates remain very high in Africa. And the result is that the African population is projected to grow from 1.4 billion today to 4.2 billion in 2100. If you can imagine it, almost 3 billion population increase. That's extraordinary. Almost a four time increase of population projected by the UN population division. The rest of the world, which is shown in the blue line here, is projected to have no net population increase over the 21st century, basically to end the 21st century at the same level of population as in 2020. And so all of the population increase expected in the 21st century is in Africa, but that is a consequence of poverty, but also likely to be a cause of poverty in the future. Now, what the UN shows is that if there were a reduction of the fertility rate to replacement level, there would still be some momentum of population growth because Africa's population is very young. So there are more children than there are parents right now. So population will continue to grow even if fertility rates come down. But the difference of having a replacement rate fertility and a medium fertility scenario is 2 billion people by the end of the century. Now, I will assert uh, in brief, and we can discuss it in the uh, discussion period, that Africa could not achieve a breakthrough out of poverty and environmental sustainability with more than 4 billion people on the continent. And so a voluntary reduction of fertility rates in my view, brought about overwhelmingly through uh, education for all, through the upper secondary level as a basis, is desirable for Africa and for the world, and is the way to overcome the uh, so-called Malthusian specter. If there is such a rapid transformation to low fertility, then the world population would actually peak or would reach about 9 billion at the end of the 21st century, up 1 billion. Whereas instead, if there is not that fertility transformation, the population would reach 11 billion. And that would be very difficult as a, uh, as a pressure against achieving sustainable development and the escape from poverty, both within Africa and at a global scale. And I will skip those to uh, come to a conclusion for today. We have two futures, both are realistic. The dystopian future is a future that's based on extrapolation. It's perfectly plausible that we'll have an awful future, awful for our children, awful, awful for our grandchildren, a planet that has been wrecked environmentally, an inequality of income that is so high that a few people have all the wealth and the rest are either unemployed and desperate or work for those few people. And we are heading for such a world right now we have four Americans, just four people. Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon, uh, Elon Musk of Tesla, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and Bill Gates of Microsoft, four people who have a combined wealth of about $550 billion. 
So this is how our markets work right now. Uh, they send the wealth and income to the top with so much desperation at the bottom that that is a realistic scenario. But as I've tried to indicate briefly, the other scenario is an investment pathway in education, health, clean energy, clean industry, sustainable land use practices, sustainable smart cities, and a digital society that fits within the resource boundaries that could stabilize the population growth, that could enable us to overcome the Malthusian specter, and that could end the great devastations of the environment that we have seen. All of this I'll call the great transformation. Of course, I'm stealing from Carl Poyani, who talked about the great transformation to the laissez-faire economy of the 19th century. We need a great transformation to sustainable development of the 21st century. In tomorrow's lecture, I want to talk about the politics, the policy framework, and the ethical framework to achieve the great transformation to sustainable development. And I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for your very, very good uh, presentation. Now I will uh, leave the power to Mario Tiberi, who will uh, interact with the participants. <laughs> Allora, parte indietro. Okay. Dicevo che eh, ricordo che abbiamo, come ricordava poco fa il professor Sachs, che abbiamo un'altra lezione domani e domani avremo anche più tempo da dedicare alle domande, perché oggi, come ricorderete, abbiamo dedicato un po' di tempo ai saluti istituzionali, a qualche incertezza tecnica, domani speriamo di essere eh, più efficienti in tutto. Allora, per quanto riguarda le domande, eh, naturalmente qui abbiamo da, da, da fronteggiare difficoltà tecniche, però speriamo di cavarcela. La raccomandazione che faccio a tutti quanti, eh, appena iniziate l'intervento, di dire, eh, dato essenziale, non so, studente, eh, professore A, eh, direttore di, di qualsiasi altra cosa e così via, e poi vi raccomando di formulare domande brevi, magari incisive, ma brevi, per consentire la massima partecipazione. Ho oh, detto questo, allora come raccogliamo le... con le chat? E la mano dove la vedo? Chi, chi vuole fare, do, fare una domanda, formulare una domanda, eh, può alzare la mano. E dove lo vedo? Compare qua. Sì. Uh, mi sente? Uh. Uh, hello? 
Um, hello. Uh, I'm oh. sorry. I am uh, a student in the Sapienza. I'm from Lebanon. I just, um, it's not a question. It's uh, more of like um, not an intervention, if I can say. Uh, we talked about um, the cycle of uh, poverty and uh, high um, uh, fertility in Africa. I just wanted to say that colonialism affected uh, poverty in uh, Africa. Like uh, the, co the colonization uh, was, uh, was like um, what impacted uh, this uh, poverty in, uh, in the continent, which um, increased uh, the poverty and increased the fertility, like talking about uh, the cycle that you talked about. Thank you, that's it. Let, let me make a, a basic point, uh, which is that you're uh, correct uh, that <coughs> almost everywhere the 19th and 20th century European and U.S. imperialism was highly detrimental to economic development uh, and, uh, of course, profoundly disrupted and undermined uh, local culture as well. Uh, it was uh, brazen and uh, ruthless. So uh, almost no country uh, during uh, its colonized phase achieved development because that was not the goal of uh, the colonizing powers. Quite the contrary, what the, the goal was resource extraction. And so it is only after decolonization that there is uh, apparent development in most of, or almost all of the, uh, uh, of the colonized world in the world in Africa, in Africa and, Africa and, 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 and please, uh, please your mic, your your mic. mic. I'm getting an echo. Uh, so if you can mute, uh, when you're not talking, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so in this sense, I think you're uh, completely correct. And that means that sovereignty gives the chance for development. It doesn't guarantee it. Uh, the conditions uh, of very poor countries are very tough. Uh, I was uh, just before the lecture speaking with leaders in the Sahel, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Mali. The conditions are very, very tough, but not impossible by any means because there's also great solar potential, Digital uh, technologies can make a big difference, but we should not underestimate the difficulties of very poor countries, especially with geographic difficulties, such as being landlocked, uh, of uh, overcoming these challenges uh, on their own. Hello. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you so much, Professor, for an excellent uh, lecture. It was uh, really an honor to listen to you. I have a question. You mentioned several times that it is um, sustainable development possibility and it is plausible. And I totally agree that it's plausible. But really looking at how the uh, society, the government, the business is going, it is very unlikely to say the least that we are really getting in the right direction even looking at the micro um, micro scale uh, thinking of how businesses are doing thinking about our impact on the climate for example how to mobilize the society and the governments and the business to actually understand that we are at the point that there is really no going back and there is no option for continuing like we do um, and just to <laughs> just to add to that is like um, uh, Greta the activist the Swedish activist mentioned once that when your house is on fire you don't sit and you don't think about okay should I leave or should I stay we should really do something and the question is how do we do it to get to to reach the possibility that you said is possible thank you Thank you. Of course, that is the topic that I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, today, I, I uh, of course, uh, skipping over all the details, uh, emphasize the feasibility 
of this trajectory, it's actually not even so expensive to do the right thing. Uh, sometimes, uh, and net net of all the harms and costs, of course, it's cheaper, but it's not even in direct outlays all that expensive to invest in the right way. So the question of why we don't is part of the topic of tomorrow. Uh, there are many reasons, uh, but part is, of course, vested interests, uh, which are powerful in the fossil fuel producing regions of the world. And partly is uh, inertia uh, and ignorance. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of ignorance uh, galore. Uh, in my country, uh, we, we have a, not only an unscientific, but an anti-scientific part of the society whose beliefs are directly uh, anti-scientific. Uh, one of the remarkable strengths uh, culturally of uh, modern uh, Roman Catholicism is the uh, harmony of uh, science and faith. I work a, a great deal with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and that is an institution that has uh, world-leading scientists looking at uh, issues like climate change. And so when Pope Francis issued the encyclical Laudato Si in 2015, it's a rigorous scientifically based uh, encyclical. But in uh, other cultural uh, traditions, uh, in American uh, evangelicalism, for example, which is a, a biblical literalism, uh, where uh, it's just not climate change, it's just not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and uh, it's an active disbelief of a significant part of the population, which happens to form a significant base of the Donald Trump Republican Party. So this kind of uh, view is also part of the explanation. In the United States, uh, just to... Uh, follow on that, about two thirds of the US population considers climate change real, caused by human beings and needing a response. Uh, the one third that doesn't is almost uh, entirely concentrated in the Republican party. And that is who Trump was appealing to in his right wing base. In the final days of our election just now, Trump, uh, uh, Biden said uh, that he's going to take on climate change and that we need to transition away from fossil fuel. And Trump thought, ah, okay, now I've won because <laughs> I'm going to attack Biden for that view. He didn't, uh, he didn't lose, Biden didn't lose because of that, he won. Uh, so I have some optimism that we can get beyond this. Will businesses move in the right direction? Well, I'll talk about that tomorrow, but I just will say that the booming businesses today in the stock market are the digital businesses. Tesla, which is the electric vehicle company, is worth more than the rest of the auto industry right now. It's maybe a financial bubble, but it is amazing. Uh, and the markets are giving high value to electric vehicles. The markets are also punishing companies like ExxonMobil, which deserve to be punished, by the way, uh, for their past misdeeds. But basically, the markets are writing down the value of hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons will need to be kept under the ground. And now the markets are figuring this out. And that is also reflected in these commitments of governments like the European Green Deal. So tomorrow I will talk about all of this, but I just wanna to say today that while it's taken us unduly long and it's brought us to an extremely difficult situation, it's not impossible that in the end, humanity will do the right thing. Um, uh, Professor Sachs, can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, so I highly appreciate the time you're given to us to talk with us. My question is going to be very precise. Um, I think uh, we, you didn't mention anything about UBI, uh, Universal Basic 
in, in income. My question is, is UBI a possible solution maybe to, let's say, alleviate the causes of poverty in Africa? Because um, I think I read somewhere where they did a test in Africa, in a region of Africa, where giving income to families or even to people started new businesses. They basically even thrive under this new sort of, um, you know, initiative. So my, my question is maybe in our society in Western world, UBI is seen, it could be seen as an excuse not to go to work because you get, you get money from the government. But maybe in countries like Africa and, you know, parts of, of the world where it's less accessible or, or even, you know, getting a job is a big deal. Could UBI be the sort of uh, solution? That's my question. That's, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think uh, there's no doubt in, in my mind that uh, we need to make uh, significant uh, resource net transfers to Africa for development now. Those can come in the form of loans, grants, gifts, development aid, foreign direct investment, but it is uh, a flow of resources to uh, do three things. One is to ensure that every child everywhere, not only Africa, but uh, for countries in need, are able to provide health, education, and nutrition for every, every child. Uh, this is a basic human need, and it's part of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I cannot imagine our objectives working if today's children are not able to get the schooling that, and the training that they need. So that is first investment. Second kind of investment is in physical infrastructure, especially right now, electrification, because we can't do anything without electrification uh, for long-term development, and uh, digital, because digital access is critical for efficient operation of every sector of the economy, including government itself. Who's going to make those investments? Partly private, partly public. Uh, but other kinds of investments include safe water and sanitation, sewage systems in cities, transport, grids, and so forth. Then there is a third kind of uh, transfer, which is uh, transfers of income to households for social support or social protection. And there is a debate whether that should come in kind, whether it should be universal, whether it should be targeted, uh, related to your question. And perhaps there's another uh, category, which is financing for business startups, whether it is micro loans or banking finance or online credits and so on. So I think the uh, key point that I uh, reflect on in this question is how to ensure that all major classes of investments get undertaken properly. The public services like health and education, the infrastructure like transport, fiber, uh, water and sanitation uh, and uh, electrification, the financing for enterprise and the financing for social protection. Maybe it's best to say four categories. Transfers of income could play a role in the third and fourth category. They cannot substitute for the first two categories of infrastructure and social services. So I don't like to see cash transfers as being a substitute, which some people do because some libertarians say, oh, development aid's horrible. Uh, just give the cash. People will take care of it. But that doesn't really reflect the reality of public goods investments, infrastructure investments, and social service investments. So my answer to the question is a little bit complicated, uh, but I would think of those four categories and then think about in which category is the direct giving to apply and is that the best way to accomplish it? 
in the circumstances of uh, the United States or Europe, I'm for universal basic dignity, but not universal basic income in the sense that I believe the key investments that need to be made are universal access to healthcare, universal access to education, universal access to training, universal access to social support for families, especially with young children or disabled, and that that would constitute an effective way to ensure universal basic income, but not through a direct check to everybody, but by the provision of universal services for everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, I would like to have, ask you a question. You have talked to us about investment. My question is, how could finance be able to address private investment to the sustainability development that you have shown us? Thank you. Yes. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, the different modes of redirecting investment. Uh, one way is uh, incentives, information, disclosure. The other way is to say, if you're going to invest, you've got to invest in so-and-so. For example, uh, suppose we know that to reach climate safety, we need to move to zero emission vehicles. One way is to give a subsidy to electric vehicles. Another way is to put a carbon tax on gasoline or uh, the European uh, um, trading system, for example. Another way is to declare after such and such date, if you want to sell a car, it has to be an electric vehicle. And so there is a class of uh, policies, some quantitative, regulatory, others uh, indicative, others market-based to try to shift investments in a different direction. I, in general, believe that when our back is to the wall on certain issues like the need to decarbonize, the quantitative, clear, time-bound uh, uh, regulation is really warranted. I would like to see our countries declare that after 2030, for example, no new vehicles can be emission vehicles. And uh, many states, cities uh, are moving in that direction. Some European cities have said after, I think Copenhagen is uh, 2024, 2025, no uh, new sales of internal combustion engine vehicles. California is just implementing no new sales after 2035. Uh, I would like to look uh, whether it's feasible and plausible to say 2030 as the limit. But I would say that uh, when it comes to, first of all, the choice of policy, which I'll talk about tomorrow, we have this range and there are pluses and minuses of the different approaches. When it comes to the role of science in helping to get the technologies right, the analogy with the moonshot, where science was directed to solve problems, mainly engineers were directed to solve problems, is a good analogy for many of the challenges we face. In other words, we have well-defined problems and to an important extent, we need engineering solutions. And this, I think, requires more mobilization of engineering talent than we have done so far. When you go to a climate, conference, it's usually packed with lawyers and diplomats, but I would like to see the climate conference packed with engineers saying, here's how to actually do it. Professor Sachs, do you yes, hear me? I do. Good evening. So uh, about the green, uh, the European Green Deal, I wanted to ask you, do you think will be, it will be sufficient without an adequate uh, policy that constrains carbon prices, which are currently too low to make uh, green actions profitable? 
the European Green Deal is, uh, first of all, a big step forward, as I said, because it is uh, well articulated across several different dimensions. It understands that the problem is energy, land use, digital, circular economy, farm systems, bravo. So that it got that part right. Second part that it's gotten right is the timelines, uh, which are ambitious uh, and uh, also realistic. But Europe being Europe, it's not a plan uh, because uh, Europe uh, then says, okay, this is our uh, framework. Now 27 countries will implement this at the national level. That will not work. Uh, we need more Europe less, uh, rather than less Europe in this because an energy system is not 27 separate national systems. It is a European wide system. Uh, it's a European wide set of standards, a European wide set of transmission uh, networks uh, for the flow of uh, the electrons. It is uh, carrying sunshine from the Mediterranean uh, to the rest of Europe. It's carrying wind power from the Black Sea or the North Sea uh, across a European wide network. So we need uh, a, a comprehensive uh, approach. Then the tools for that need to be worked out. As I just emphasized, you could use pricing uh, or you could use regulation. I think Europe should use more regulation actually. And at the national level, it's doing that by these complicated negotiations, for example, in Germany and Spain recently to close down the coal sector. Uh, in the so-called just transition. So Germany said by 2038, coal will be eliminated, uh, a, a phase down over time. It's a little long, but it's not bad to have the zero commitment and the timeline to do it. What it will mean is no new coal plants will be built. That's not because of the European trading system. It's because of a regulatory framework that no power company would get licensed to build a new coal-fired power plant. So I believe we should be using regulation more, pricing a bit less. I'll say more about that tomorrow, but I will say that when we face the ozone depletion problem with the chlorofluorocarbons and adopted the Montreal Protocol, the solution was not to tax chlorofluorocarbons or even make tradable permits, the solution was to outlaw them and to say within 10 or 15 years, depending on the class of the CFC, you must stop producing them and you must stop using them. And I think that that approach was one of the main reasons why uh, we saved the ozone layer, because it was not uh, price-based, but it was quantity-based and it was very clear and the major producers shifted within 10 years so that they stopped producing the CFCs. It's much simpler in that context than with carbon, but I think the analogy works. No, thank you. No, non sono Giovanni Di Bartolomeo, ma sono Mario Di Belli, ho dovuto cambiare postazione appunto per uno di quei piccoli incidenti di percorso. Eh, abbiamo seguito un ottimo ritmo di domande e risposte, per cui possiamo includere l'ultima domanda e anche l'ultima risposta. Eh, parla Lavinia Carlotta, eh, poi dunque Lavinia Carlotta Lombardo Passavia. Spero di aver detto tutto giustamente con nome e nome. Non c'è più. Non so se si posso parlare. Non so se si è stato qualche incidente di percorso, però potremo recuperare la, la sua domanda domani, mentre invece adesso possiamo chiudere il nostro primo incontro con il professor Sachs. 
e ringrazio come ha fatto anche prima il direttore del, del, del Dipartimento per la sua illuminante lezione, sicuramente ha reso più impaziente il desiderio di ascoltare The Great Transformation, che è il titolo della, della sua lezione di, di domani. Ringrazio tutti i partecipanti, eh, donne e uomini che hanno voluto partecipare a questa nostra iniziativa, ringrazio tutti i tech che ci hanno aiutato, in particolare eh, l'interprete che ha svolto un lavoro molto faticoso che ho potuto apprezzare quando di tanto in tanto mi sono collegato con la, con la sua voce piuttosto che con quella de, del professor Sachs. Allora, arrivederci a domani pomeriggio. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Really uh, appreciate it. See you tomorrow. Yeah.